At this point in the semester, we've already covered how to build effective arguments by discussing the structure of a rational argument. When discussing the structure of a rational argument, we talked about the need to have a claim followed by data and warrants that unpack that data. We then developed that by talking about how effective arguments also often include things like a qualifier, reservations, and addressing necessary reservations and rebuttals. Those additional terms we included as part of our Tuleman model. In building that Tuleman model, we then explored different ways you can structure rational arguments as fact arguments, value arguments, or policy arguments. You've spent a considerable amount of time developing at this point a very sophisticated policy argument. As we transition in the remainder of this lesson, we'll be starting to focus on theories of persuasion. As we think about theories of persuasion, in this video, I want to unpack four different theories of persuasion. To do that, though, I think it's helpful to think a little bit about what a theory means and how we might divide theories into two different categories of theories that we'll describe as theories that are pre-decision theories and theories that are post-decision theories. This brief video begins to unpack what is a theory and what is a pre-decision theory and what is a post-decision theory. So first, what is a theory? A theory is a system of ideas that's intended to explain something, especially something that's based on general principles that's often independent of the thing to be explained. Many of you have already taken previous communication courses, and so perhaps you've heard of theories like uncertainty reduction theory or expectancy violation theory. This might be an opportunity to reflect on what those theories mean and how they help explain some of the circumstances that we might live through in our everyday lives as communicators. As we think about what theory offers us as audiences, theory provides us a set of principles or an understanding of the way that an activity is based. It helps us understand something perhaps like a theory of the most effective way to educate adolescent children. Of course, as we think about now moving classes online with increasing emphasis on educational outcomes, we might ask questions about the effectiveness of online education versus in-person education and come up with different theories about the way online education might offer advantages or disadvantages from in-person education. And of course, theories are designed to not only account for a single situation or action, but also help explain phenomena that occur in our everyday lives all around us. So as we return to uncertainty reduction theory, that often tells us how we might get to know somebody through introductions. Perhaps we're uncertain and we have certain levels of anxiety and so we ask questions about where that person is from. We then reciprocate. They tell us where they're from, we tell them where they're from. They tell us what high school we went to, we tell them what high school we went to. And on we go until we begin to build a relationship. That's in part theorized by uncertainty reduction theory. Alternatively, perhaps you have that first meeting and something goes awry. Maybe they make an odd joke or even do something aghast at the dinner table. Well, that might be an expectation violation. An expectancy violation theory suggests that when people violate your expectations, it can go in one of two ways, positively or negatively. Negative violations are perceived poorly and otherwise end or otherwise cause trouble in a relationship. Positive violations can lead to positive evaluations in ways that might boost social reputation or social esteem. This is just some of what expectancy violation theory seeks to explain as what are otherwise very complex phenomena. So as we transition into beginning to think about how we theorize communication, whether that be something like introductions or something like the violations of expectations, we might start to narrow in on how we act persuasively throughout that process. In part, it's important to think about the way that persuasive theories only capture part of a truth. There is, of course, no one theory of communication or no one theory of how to win an argument or otherwise better explain the circumstances and conditions of our arguments. So theory, in many ways, just helps us capture parts of particular holes in a scenario or a web of interconnected truths. In fact, communication theories are often directly tied to action or otherwise things that we can live out and experience in our real worlds. Perhaps some of you have experiences that are unusual or different or are things that you might use to challenge the media or challenge the kind of political and social arguments you see around you. Web into those, read more about those, follow those pursuits and passions, and you might be well on your way to developing a unique and strong theory of your own. 
One of my favorite quotes that I was reading when I was young and in grad school was from a fellow by the name of Anderson who describes theory as a set of instructions for reading the world and acting within it. And I find that to be a powerful explanation of theory, this idea that not only is a set of instructions, but also that it's performative in the sense that it helps us better understand how we live and act in the world. And of course, that's as true of something like the theory of gravity or the theory of relativity as it might also be of theories of communication. As we continue to develop the way that we understand theory, I want to break what a theory is into four distinct parts. The first I'll note are the philosophical assumptions of a theory. The second I'll describe are the concepts or the very building blocks of theory. The third are the explanations, the connections that that theory makes and the way that it elaborates. And finally, fourth, are the principles or the guidelines for action associated with theory. So, as we think about the philosophical assumptions, let's return to a theory like expectancy violation theory and consider what its philosophical assumptions are. If you recall, expectancy violation theory begins by assuming that people prefer stability and natural homeostasis in their lives. When somebody does something that is out of the usual or un extraordinarily weird, it tends to violate their perceptions of those individuals. Now, it might violate them, as we noted earlier, in ways that are positive or in ways that are negative. But the philosophical assumption of expectancy violation theory is that people prefer things to be predictable and stable. Now, it uses various different concepts. One of those concepts it uses is proximity, and it describes how people prefer a certain social distance apart from one another. Perhaps you can think of a time you've ridden in an elevator, and while it was completely empty, somebody stood too close to you in the elevator. Perhaps that standing very close to you in the elevator made you feel uncomfortable, or perhaps they smelt of a nice cologne or perfume, and it made you think that they were attracted to you. Well, that's an example of a concept known as proximity, and the way that proximity might relate to various different positive or negative evaluations. Now, the ability to explain that experience you're having in the elevator translates not only to its single opportunity of the elevator experience, but also perhaps to things like interviews, where perhaps proxemics or sitting too close in an interview context could also create violations that might cause problematic scenarios for both the employer and the interviewer. And so again, this theory, expectancy violation theory, has a unique explanatory power because it works not only in individual situations like an elevator, but also in organizational situations like company structures. Finally, this theory doesn't just have explanations, but it offers certain principles or guidelines for action. As a matter of fact, expectancy violation theorists have actually created a chart which models the distances that individuals should stay from one another in an intimate, interpersonal, social, and public communication zone. You can find that chart online, and if I'm able, I'll try to link that here in the video connected. As we think a little bit about what the power or focus of theory is, we should note that quasi-theories are able to only do the first two things. So they provide us some philosophies and some concepts, but they don't exactly give us any unique explanatory power or allow us to make principled guides for action. You might think about some of the conspiracy theories you've thought about or heard about on social media or in various different web networks. Those are more often than not quasi-theories because they don't actually offer authentic explanations or provide true principles and guidelines for action. Indeed, most theories worthy of consideration should have at least the first three of those things, philosophical assumptions, concepts, and explanations. The result, or the goal of any theory, is to formulate and articulate a set of labeled concepts to be able to need to explain something like an expectancy violation or the uncertainty we might feel when naming a new individual in a context of someplace like an airplane, a bus station, or even just in social media. Being able to better understand how we might process uncertainty or expectancy violations allows us to better understand how communicative phenomenon work not just in single individual scenarios, but also in social, cultural, organizational, and political or collective scenarios as well. Those quasi-theories that stop at the conceptual level are also known as taxonomies, because taxonomies don't exactly provide an understanding of how things work, they just tell us the way things are. You might be familiar with the term taxonomy as you think about the way that we name plants or animals after Latin 
homo species, genus, and species origins. Those ability to say something like homo sapiens, sorry, and genus and species relate to the taxonomy. It provides us an ability to put all the various different animals, plants, into different kingdoms, phylums, families, and so on. But it doesn't necessarily allow us to know which of those work hierarchically, who's the king of the animal kingdom, if you will, or otherwise how those things can better explain our lives. It just puts them into different containers or boxes. Hence, a quasi-theory of a taxonomy.